is now our queue, yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, I know it's after lunch, we're going to try and keep you awake as far as possible. Today we're going to be talking about migrations and workload migration within the OpenStack community, and it hopefully will be a fun topic to get through. We've got a big group with us today, uh, more of a play than a presentation. So I am Sean O'Mara, I'm a senior systems architect with Mirantis, um, and the EMEA architecture lead for the services group. I have quite a bit of experience with migrations, both as a customer and from within Mirantis. Ernest De Leon, Cloud Architect with Mirantis and Senior Manager for the Services Engineering. We've got Roman Virchikov, Software Lead Engineer, looks after the product we use for migration. Irat Karetinov. Irat works for one of our partners, CloudOps. And not with us today is Samir, who's the Project Manager for Workload Migration. Right. So, we're going to cover an introduction to workload migration, when to migrate, is it a good idea, why and why not, assessing workload migration viability, and what happens during a migration, so what is the process behind it, and how long does a migration take. So, a little bit of background. Is a migration a good idea? Well, all your apps are built cloud native, aren't they? Show of hands, whose apps works with a company that only has apps that are cloud native. Yeah. <laughs> kind of the expected answer. Love the participation. In a perfect world, yes, we don't want to migrate workload. We don't want to have to worry about the pain of moving workloads from legacy systems or even other clouds. It should just be recreated. But we don't live in a perfect world. The short answer. So. Why migrate? Well, we've always got legacy applications that we have to deal with. Those applications need to be moved onto new infrastructure as quickly as possible. Quite often we don't know these workloads or understand what's part of these workloads for a huge number of reasons. Uh, everything from they were 20 years ago to the people who wrote them have left to just sheer complexity. Time to market, we want to move quickly. When we build a cloud service, a big part of that is cost saving. If we can move, reduce the cost of managing that infrastructure, we can move applications onto it, it helps us with our time to market. And the last one, which is the common one that we've seen, is upgrades. When you're changing a cloud and when you're building new clouds and you want to upgrade OpenStack in place, we all know that that's been a big question for a long time now, whether or not we can open, upgrade OpenStack in place. What we've been doing up till now, largely, is workload migration from other OpenStack clouds across moving all the workload, moving all the data, moving all the uh, information about your cloud. The other reasoning, customer impact. I want to move information. I want to upgrade. I can reduce my customer impact. They don't have to go and recreate applications. And finally, a big one is architectural change. I want to implement a new SDN solution. I can build a new cloud. And we've got a guest in the room. Wow. Hello. Oh, that's not on. That one's not working. Hand the mic. So the Marantis bear has joined us. Now, Marantis has a number of bears. We've got bears and teddy bears. Hello. 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 Mm. Hello. This is quite tasty. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Good, good. I, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'll come around and maul each of you individually if I don't get a better response. How's everyone doing? All right, I'll take it. It's, it's Tuesday. Yeah, I love you too. More noise and maybe there'll be vodka afterwards. That's more noise and I will chug vodka afterwards. <laughs> How is everyone doing? You guys are going to see something at Stack City you've never seen before then. Drunk bear wandering around, it'll be great. Drunk bear and a guy in a kilt wandering around. Yeah, that <laughs> get both of us in the same picture and you get a special prize. All right, no, I'm uh, Thank you, you. You're very welcome. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Sorry for the interruption. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, bear. So we had the surprise visit from the Rantus Bay. Okay, carrying on. 
There are a number of reasons why you would not want to migrate your cloud. At the end of the day, you're continuing bad practice from your legacy applications. Traditional design practices are usually not appropriate for moving workload into cloud. And infrastructure availability, which is the traditional world, we make infrastructure more available rather than the applications more available. Cloud design criteria, pretty much the same reason. Cloud native apps work better in cloud. They allow us to take advantage of the capabilities of cloud, workload migration, scaling, all of those things. Infrastructure restrictions, you know, part of the reason clouds can be built cheaper is we can use commodity hardware. But of course that means failure rates are higher. So it's those sorts of things we have to take into account. Supportability of legacy. Legacy applications are a nightmare to support. People leave, you lose the flexibility within our clouds because now, of course, we can't just shut down components and hope the application recovers. And cost. The parallel support costs of maintaining your clouds when you have legacy applications are huge. And finally, lots and lots of extra infrastructure. So now we get a little bit into the meat and potatoes of <clears throat> what happens during a migration. So Sean covered, you know, should you migrate or should you not, which is kind of the, the most important question and why should you or why shouldn't you. I think it's kind of implicit in there that if you have a native app that's designed for cloud migration, it kind of takes care of itself, mostly. Uh, <clears throat> so the next part is, so we've decided we want to migrate, right, from one cloud to another or from, usually it's from one cloud to another, but it could be from legacy equipment to a cloud. So what do you do? Right, so the first thing you do is you have to do a technical deep dive into each application architecture. Right, so you identify all the applications and usually, depending on how your tenants have designed these, they can fall into projects or they may be spread across multiple projects, they might be spread across multiple clouds. Either way, you want to assess that and understand in deep detail what is the application architecture, what is the functionality of the application, right? What is it delivering at the end of the day and are there any SLA expectations both from the application to end users and from your uh, infrastructure to the application owner. So in that process, you kind of have four major areas that you focus on. The first thing is identifying all the application stakeholders. This is usually a diverse group of people from you know, a, a business owner who's, who's signing the uh, check for all of this that's being written and migrated. This includes application architect, both software and hardware. This can include uh, you know, lead developers. Um, this can include you know, project managers that, that uh, oversee this application and it running, and then, you know, technical account managers. If, you ha if it's a customer-facing application, there's a whole lot of other people. So you have to find out who the key stakeholders are to understand what their requirements are in terms of a migration. Uh, the second thing is you set up the uh, technical deep dive call with all of the, the tenants, right, to understand in detail all of these things. One of the things you request uh, to have at those calls are uh, logical application architecture diagrams so that you can dig into the nuts and bolts, again, of how the application is distributed, if, if it is, you know, uh, what are all the components that make it up, what network segments are it on, what type of storage does it use, uh, all those kind of things. And usually in those diagrams, it gives you enough of a, of a view to be able to ask the right questions in terms of what you need to know about that application. Then the last thing you do is, you know, review the architecture in detail. So once you get all that data, the next thing that happens is you go through a series of questions for each one of the applications. So the first thing you need to understand, right, is it highly available, is it fault tolerant, and is it distributed? These are just kind of looking at ways that you can take parts of the application offline without affecting the overall functionality of that application. If they're not, right, if these are legally, and legacy applications that scaled up instead of out, you have to take that into consideration, right, and it means that there probably will be downtime. Um, is the application wholly contained within the OpenStack environment? So <clears throat> this is one that we've run across quite a few times where someone did a lift and shift of an application and kind of dropped it into the cloud, but a, let's say a portion of the application couldn't fit in the cloud. Uh, for example, the, uh, the data store was on an Oracle database that was far too large to fit inside the cloud. So they put all of the other tiers of the application into the cloud and just put direct pipe back to an Oracle database. That's a problem, right? <clears throat> you, you need to be able to uh, address that. We've had others where people have connected physical routers via layer two into the side of the cloud for like VoIP applications, right? That's something that has to be taken into consideration. So you want to understand, it, you know, is the application wholly contained in OpenStack and, and therefore easy to move or do you have hooks into other infrastructure outside of the cloud that make it more difficult? Um, 
ephemeral instances are critical uh, in terms of <clears throat> OpenStack, right? Because unlike AWS, where there's you know an implicit understanding that an ephemeral instance, if it goes away for any reason, is gone, right? And the application designer knows that. OpenStack doesn't treat ephemeral instances in the same way, right? And the use cases being used in OpenStack are a little bit different in terms of how they're using them. So uh, usually they're trying to get uh, uh, disk speed advantages. And so you could end up with, for example, large distributed databases that have <clears throat> data that is semi-persistent on the nodes themselves. And you may have to migrate that, you may not, right? So you need to understand that. Uh, the last thing is it, is the application comprised of pets or cattle? And this goes back to what Sean was saying, right? So legacy applications are probably mostly comprised of pets. And pets are things that you care about, right? Those are they're things that you can't just you know, destroy and not worry about because you, you need that application to run. You need every component of it. Cattle is the exact opposite. It's that thing where you can move them around, you can shift them around, and one moving doesn't affect the others, right? And so you, you don't have to give a specific care to that, that uh, cattle VM. So that's kind of the, the, the thought of, you know, assessing the viability. Now, once you've done that and you've deemed a workload viable for migration, the next thing you do is actually proceed into the planning stages of migrating. Yep. Hey, everyone. I'm Roman. I'm going to give a brief overview of how migration actually goes and what do we do and what kind of problems we uh, experience and how do we deal with it. So this is actually where we started and um, in reality uh, it never worked. Um, so we, uh, so as you see this schema is quite complex and not really readable so we had to simplify everything and what we decided is that we will migrate each tenant separately with all the load that tenant has and uh, instead of having um, moving hardware from one cloud to the other, we decided that we need uh, a destination cloud set up and ready before that we, we, do, we do migration. So, so what happens? Um, so most of the objects in OpenStack are migrated using OpenStack APIs, uh, which means that unique identifiers for those objects are not kept in the destinations. So, um, uh, that's, that's for the most part. This is, most of the objects are done doing this. So we read objects from source cloud, then we run um, OpenStack APIs to recreate same objects in destination. This is, sounds kind of simple, but uh, some objects need magic. And well, in Mirantius, magic means glass of vodka and then, um, the next morning you wake up and everything's done magically. Um, no, unfortunately not. Uh, so what you really need to, so in reality, life is more complex. So uh, there are several objects which, re which require treatment, which are floating IPs, quota, usage, volumes, and ephemeral storage. So I'll go over those in a while. So with floating APs, we have two challenges. First one is we want to keep, if we want to keep floating APs, uh, then user and APIs, unfortunately, does not allow us to specify the same floating AP uh, using APIs itself. So uh, for that case, we need to kind of enter God mode and do direct database manipulations and kind of pretend we're being neutron uh, which obviously means that um, this solution is difficult to maintain and needs to be tested real carefully before we start doing anything. Uh, the other problem is IP conflicts, which may occur. So uh, obviously, if you keep same floating IPs in source and destination cloud, you may have a situation when you have two floating IPs in different uh, zones. And uh, in order to resolve that, you would need to uh, move VMs first, then detach floating APs from source cloud and associate them uh, in the destination and after that shut down uh, VM in source cloud. So the other thing is quota usage. So Nova supports uh, keeping track of uh, usage of resources. But the problem is that when we do the migration, it's usually being done with some super user admin account. So all the objects and destination are kind of recreated with 
from one um, user and thus, um, well, database and destination will be different uh, from what we have in source cloud. Thus, again, we need to enter God mode and modify uh, database directly. And again, the same problems. It's dangerous and difficult to maintain, but yeah, that's the only way so far. Um, the other one is volume migration. So obviously, simply recreating volumes and destination doesn't make much sense. You need to transfer data as well. Um, and for that, you would need to figure out what is the Cinder backend to move data from one cloud to the other. Um, and uh, you know that Cinder currently supports like more than 50 different backends, like CanFS, iSCSI, Fiber Channel, all of that, different vendors. Um, and this means that data needs to be transferred in different manner. So for NFS, for example, it's, it's just a copy of simple file. For iSCSI, it means that we need to copy from block device to block device. So and also all those different combinations. So you need to uh, design your migration tool to do that. Um, the other problem is networking bandwidth problem, which occur all the time. So like we, we had, sometimes we had uh, data transfer speed like under 500 kilobytes per second, which is quite slow. So you would want, you may want to uh, expect this kind of problems. And also, uh, again, networking problems and data transfer problems. So in order to resolve those, what you would do is you would split huge volumes into smaller chunks and transfer each small chunk separately and you would repeat an error. Now, yes. So the solution, it is a solution, yes. Yeah, God mode, it is a solution. <laughs> Wait for the Q&A afterwards, we can give you a bit more detail. Okay. Yeah, so, so with ephemeral, we have similar problems. Um, so again, different types of backends, NFS, uh, just local storage, networking problems. So again, um, um, you would want to know how the files are stored in source and destination in order to copy those, and then you would want to repeat on networking problems and split huge files into smaller chunks. Now, with that, I give my word to Irit. So um, now the final step, I want to know how long uh, does migration take? Uh, usually once people know how long it takes, they don't want to do migration. <laughs> but uh, before getting to that, uh, we want to know why we want to do the, uh, why we want to know how long uh, the migration takes. So first is risk planning. So basically every migration brings potential uh, risk of downtime. So you want to be prepared for that and know when uh, the tenant will be migrated. Uh, once you know how long it takes, you can also come up with a proper cost, uh, come up with a proper schedule for the tenants and uh, plan. Basically everybody wants to know when this migration is going to end. So. Before uh, also finding out how long it takes, we want to know what we're actually migrating. And um, first approach is basically to do the migration in one uh, shot, the kind of a bing bang approach. Uh, so as we already discussed, those migrations are usually doesn't make sense. Uh, one thing comes in mind, if you have a public cloud, you cannot really select, you have to migrate everything. And you have to meet SLAs with your tenants, but um, in a normal case, uh, it's even hard to do this because if you want to do migration in one bank, you need to have destination cloud to be the same size as the source cloud, and it's pretty much very expensive, right? So in order to tackle that, you want to do the migration in a progressive way, so you would be migrating tenants per tenants. Uh, so the first way of doing it is basically identify uh, business critical uh, projects that you want to basically move and um, that way you would avoid to have uh, you know f to, to fill up your cloud on the destination side and also you're basically focusing exactly what you need to migrate 
another case, it could be you just want to migrate uh, some VMs between tenants or on a different cloud. So now we know how to do this. Um, I will just quickly explain the, the way we are automated, uh, the, the time estimation discovery sort of. Uh, so first we collect data from source and destination cloud, uh, uh, create test volume images and uh, ephemeral uh, VMs with ephemerals and do the test migration and basically get the speed, speeds. And finally, once you know the, the data that you want to migrate and the speeds, you pretty much can do the time estimation. And then you can plan your migration, set the schedules for the migration, and you can see that you might have very slow speeds, so you might need to address your links. Uh, you might go through the one more iteration of collecting data and I estimating your speeds, and then uh, pretty much you, you schedule your, you make your final schedule and you start your migration. So now we'll just go quickly uh, on each of these points, and we can ramp up. So. As I said, when we do collection of migration data, we basically discover uh, both clouds and store it in, in a database. And then we just basically uh, present size views per, per tenant. So uh, the most important things to consider is images, volumes, and uh, VM ephemerals, because this is actually the data that needs to be migrated. And uh, we also can provide uh, a list of unused resources. So, for example, there are volumes that are not attached. There are images that are not used for booting VMs. So, we can provide it, and basically, just you can do the cleanup on them. Uh, the OpenStack resource migration is pretty much fast because it's automated and it's only metadata to migrate. So, usually, it's not considerable, and pretty much we can also provide total sizes per cloud. So, this is just example from the last project. Uh, this is just numbers fresh in mind. So. Uh, so you can see here the glance transfer we perform for the APIs, so we get speeds around 40 megabits per second, and for ephemerals and cinder volumes with NFS, uh, you can use rsync and SCP, very slow transfer speeds, so we found there is like other transport protocols, uh, one of them BBCP, so we got pretty much good speeds uh, based on our link. And finally, for the iSCSI, there is no other invention than just do the block-by-block -block copy, and the speeds are very slow. So we have everything. Uh, we have data, uh, sizes, and we have speeds. So pretty much this is just example of one tenant where they had images of one terabyte, ephemeral of, of three terabyte, and volume uh, of tw 20 terabyte. So the migration of the volume was done by uh, transferring from NFS to NFS backend. So this is the speed. So the final, and we also have to consider the OpenStack resource migration, which is, uh, involves migration of identity, computer resources, and networking. So the total time for this tenant was 34 hours. And as we said, we pretty much, the, the migration of the OpenStack resources is negligible. It takes a couple of hours, I would say, for, for the whole thing. But um, also, migration duration increases. Uh, basically, if you have more data to migrate, it's, it's basically the linearly increasing the, the, the time. So there is no pretty much magic there. So yeah, and uh, finally, once we have all of this data, we can ramp up with the planning, uh, provide information for cloud owners, uh, if possible, address uh, link speeds issues, and assess uh, which tenants are good candidates for migration, basically what just guys covered, and basically go for the migration. Uh, we also try to use best practices where possible, so um, for cinder volumes and ephemerals, we try to use better transport protocols. Uh, we try to do the parallel migration. If you do automation, we, you can always uh, automate to the way that you can do this in parallel. And uh, finally, um, yesterday we had a talk where we discussed everything about data migration. So you can find the link in the YouTube. But basically, you, you have other ways, basically not migrating data at all, where you can reattach your storage or you can replicate your data. So you can also look into those. So I'm transferred to our Kelt. Thanks, Eric. So all of this is being done through a set of tools that Morant has built, which we use through our services team, the sheer complexity of clouds 
and the fact that we're manipulating everything in the background, and this requires hacking a little bit at your clouds to make everything work, uh, we do this as a services product. So that was the question you were asking. So we have a set of tools. Um, So if you want to go and have a look at them, they are far, fairly complex and they can be found on Git. Just look from the Rantus Git. Um, but I would suggest that you speak to your Marantus services rep around that to find out because of the sheer complexity of doing this. So any questions? And thank you for listening to us. I, I, this is two questions, maybe. So you uh, provided that number of hours for the migration. Was that all downtime? Is that everything off during that whole thing? Effectively, yes. Okay. It can be done. Sorry, it can be done in smaller chunks. You could do it at an instance at a time. So the software does allow us to do that. So, but you also have to take into account dependencies. So one of the, the levels of complexity that we handle is the linkage of the two clouds and the two environments to handle that, but that is very dependent on the architecture. Yeah, and I'll add to that, for these particular uh, customers, the vast majority of the tenants we moved ha had multiple zones active at any given time. So this was indicative of one zone being down, so the other zone was still up. So the application was not down, but a zone was offline during this time. So, you know might help you. And I also noticed on the chart that was showing the various copy protocols for ephemeral data, under API you just have a little X as not an option. Um, there's, there's a block migration uh, option in the API, it, right? Does it's it, almost impractically slow. Okay. And it tends to fail randomly. It, it fails for me all the time, and I was Pretty wondering much, yeah. if it fails for everyone or if I'm doing something wrong. No. <laughs> I think everybody has Fair experienced enough. it failing. Has, it, has anybody attempted to fix it or addressed it, or is it just a, a thing that nobody cares about and has been fully sidelined? I'm fairly sure that there are Git reviews for it. I haven't looked at it recently. I don't think anybody here has. No. No, no, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. So in your example, uh, were these two clouds actually on talking to each other? Yes, yeah. they were. Yeah, and, so. and you've got the same networks with the same external connectivity. How, how can you have the IPs uh, be present at the same time? Yeah, so I'll let Irat handle that, or Roman, or I can explain it. So, so what happens is, you're exactly right, they're, they're two disparate clouds, right? And, and even to the extent that these are two totally different versions of OpenStack as well. So what happens is they extend the network between the two clouds when they set up the destination cloud, and they plumb everything the same on the destination. In other words, all the IPs are available, but they're not in use. And like I think it was Roman that pointed out in his presentation, when yeah, you were talking about floating IPs, right? But in in lots of cases, yeah, we are actually extending our tenant networks onto uh, our bigger backbones, uh, right? Which, which are public addresses. They're really not uh, uh, private uh, addresses that are NATed or anything. So, so floating IPs are the, are the challenge because of the way that OpenStack handles floating IPs. You can, through OpenStack, assign a specific IT, IP. Um, what we typically have done in the past is we turn off the DHCP in one of the clouds. Okay. So the, des the destination cloud will turn off the ability to assign until the migration is completed for that segment. And were you actually taking uh, the, the database from one cloud and just uh, populating uh, it no. together? No. no. So the, the guys explained with the APIs is we actually suck all the information out of the source cloud through the APIs, through uh, quite a large number of API calls, and then reform the data so that we can do transforms on the data and then push it back into the new cloud. So hence we use the, lose the UUIDs. Uh, yeah. I, I'm still curious about you know, the IPs when we are connecting both clouds to an external network and they both have to be routed on the, for the same IPs. So. It, it, I wasn't talking about floating IPs. Right? Shared gateways, it, it can be handled fairly easily in, at an L3 layer. Okay. Um, there is the challenge of preventing both clouds using the same IP blocks. Yeah. Okay. So quite often what we've, you know, you'll end up doing things, if you're forced to have both clouds active at the same time, you have to cut the blocks in half or restrict the number of addresses available. 
but you managed to move this entire cloud within that 20 hour period? So this is one, the, the example is one portion of a far larger cloud. Um, I, we, the, this was almost two years ago now with the same tool set. Uh, we moved a cloud that had just on 400 terabytes of data um, in small chunks over a period of about eight weeks, moving approximately and somewhere around 500 gigs a day. During those eight weeks, you had both networks. Both clouds running, both clouds available, with customers being able to work in both clouds. Uh, and, and what were you doing with the, the, the subnets that were shared between the two? So every day we rerun the API transfer, the transform, so that check of the old cloud, compare it to the new cloud, and move the changes okay. across. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the tools then. Thanks. Uh, I mean, probably more detailed than you If you'd like to come up afterwards, we can have a quick chat sure. about it, and I can tell you a bit more. Right. Thanks. Anybody else? We did say we wanted to do it quicker. <laughs> right. You guys have all got time for a 10-minute postprandial nap before your next session. Thank you very much.